have a resolution produced too late for the printed docket. Do you give the nature of the resolution? It is a resolution which would approve the deletion of the public access channel by American Cablevision. In 1979, the city council made the cable company set up a public access channel to give time to any community group. In 1988, when the Klan asked for a show, the council got rid of the public access channel. I don't believe that America uh, should uh, stand up with open arms to receive the rhetoric of, of people who stand for murder. I feel, and the law department has indicated to us, that this is not a First Amendment issue. I'm a First Amendment fundamentalist. I think the Klan should be on uh, cable television simply because the, the only way to get rid of cockroaches is to turn on the lights. And I think the lights need to be turned on these people, and they need to be faced openly. We firmly believe that it was not a free speech issue, and it is not a free speech issue. Uh, the Klan is, has been historically a terrorist organization. Executions are an historical trademark of the Klan. And its members have led and participated in thousands of illegal acts of violence against blacks, Catholics, and Jews. It's a black man in Parkville, Missouri, whose home was burned November the 8th. No television station in the metropolitan area, to my knowledge, has covered that. The black man called the police and everything. And when the police came out, he gave him a flyer about recruitment membership to the Ku Klux Klan. The history of this in Kansas and Missouri before the Civil War, when all these people were killed, anyone who was opposed to slavery was taken out and shot and killed, and their towns were burned down and all this sort of thing. Was this past summer, the, a cross was burned in the Kansas City area, and at the same meeting, uh, a, a swastika was displayed. Besides marches and cross burnings, the Klan has found a new way to get its message out. Television. In 1989, this show, hosted by Klan sympathizer Tom Metzger, was on the air in 20 cities throughout the United States. Metzger was taking advantage of public access cable channels, which allowed any group to do a TV show. Oh. Beginning of 1987, the programming directors and programming managers, community programming managers, knew that the Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina's uh, community access system were on the system and that they were going to be working their way from the East Coast to the West Coast. More than two years ago, uh, two members of the Missouri Knights of the KKK appeared at our office unannounced and uh, asked that we play the Race and Reason tapes. We looked at several of their Race and Reason and I said, this is real poor production. And putting that on is not going to affect anything because it's real bad. It was worse than other talk shows that were then on Channel 20. The public access channel in Kansas City, which featured small town parades and cooking tips, would have to also feature the Ku Klux Klan and the Klan would do its weekly broadcast in a studio two blocks from one of Kansas City's largest black housing complexes. The American Cable Vision office is located right in the heart of the black community. And when you bring Klansmen in their garb and little turbans and stuff with the Klan symbols into the black community to apply to put a program on, you create a whole lot of uh, activity. You create a lot of fright and terror. Uh, Black people were up in arms and were very upset about it. Emotionally, you know, the Klan were good at uh, uh, doing the right things that would uh, get them to react in an emotional nature, uh, such as calling down and saying we're going to have uh, skinheads guarding our people while they're taping. And so we began to meet with those tenants and organize. We also began to meet with preachers throughout the community, community organizations and folk and we organized to influence the city council people to work with the American Cable Vision to keep them off. They got real nervous about the Klan wanting to be on, and in a, in a meeting with Nate and Carol Rothwell, they said, let's use this issue of the Klan to eliminate public access. 
And I said, you can't eliminate public access. It's a part of the contract, a part of the franchise. And Carol said, want to bet? I think we can do it. Lo and behold, we got this message from what they called a deep throat in City Hall that they were going to dump public access because the Klan wanted access and they could no longer block their access to the station. And they were going to do this in a business meeting at City Hall in May, late May, and then they were make the decision in this business meeting and then bring it before the full council and basically do it before there was any public discussion about it at all. At that time, uh, I began to initiate communication with city officials, particularly uh, Reverend Emmanuel Cleaver, uh, uh, Councilman John Sharp, and provide them with a great deal of information regarding what kinds of things can be done. It's a simple uh, issue for me. Uh, because I'm one of the targets. City Council member Emmanuel Cleaver led the fight to keep the Klan off the air. I wish the people in this place could have come to my home at 3 a.m. in the morning in 1980 when my wife and my children were huddled by the stairwell waiting on the police to come and when they arrived the cross is burning in my lawn. Ms. Collins. Mr. Cleaver, I've been there and we have children. Joanne Collins was one of two council members who voted for letting the Klan have its TV show. As a black person, it was very important for me to make a statement that if I fight for the right to vote, and the right to speak, the right to access, then I should fight for others to maintain that also. No. City council member John Sharp says a Klan TV show would have made black-white relations worse. And to say that we should give them free television time to recruit new members and to poison uh, more Americans' minds against other Americans, I think is ridiculous. While we must fight all hatred, we must not give in to fear. Council member Catherine Shields says a Klan TV show might have been valuable. But you don't pretend that racism doesn't exist. Racism does exist, and it's horrible, and it's ugly. And maybe part of the educational process is for people seeing it and understanding how horrible and how ugly and how unacceptable it is. It prefers to arm itself and to police what it feels the country is unable to police. Wherever there is a race issue in America, they are sure to be there. There was a lot of information that came out of the uh, Anti-Defamation League, Center for Democratic Renewal, and then the, uh, the bigotry and violence in Cablevision. Uh, a lot of that material I made available to uh, the uh, political leaders here in Kansas City, uh, not for the purpose of for them to try to establish uh, a blockage or inhibitor to the Klan's request, but to provide them information in terms of there's other things that they can do in terms of alternative programming. Well, specifically, the community access producers as an organization offered two hours of programming, counter-programming, on either side of a half-hour program the Klan wished to present, and that was rejected. It was our feeling that none of these people really truly understood what public access re represents to the community. We, in fact, believe that Tom Metzer and them scouted the country looking for a Kansas City, one where it was not a strong entity uh, in the community. Public access was a commitment by the cable company, by Kansas City Cable Company, that they disliked. If you tried to get the, uh, the quality up on the channel, they say, what are you doing? Don't do that. We want to get rid of that. Don't spend that time doing that. Do other things. Go out and make money. Work with ad sales. Take the equipment away from them and, and do stuff for ad sales. We had to share our public access studios with all kinds of people making car commercials and, you know, selling things. I mean, just all, you know, it was a lot of times you wouldn't be able to get the good cameras. And there were, I mean, and we're talking about like 1640s and and then 18, 1800, you know. So it got to the point where, you know, well, how much is local origination? How much is public access? Previously, access and LO were pretty well melded into one big happy family. We had staff people working on staff projects and hiring as part-time some of the people who were also access users on their own shows. And we had a little too much blending of one into the other, and it all occurred in one studio, which was maximized.
it was my responsibility and, and that of the staff to think of ways to, to screw the community producers as much as possible. Stick enough roadblocks in the way so that they would get disgusted and quit. And so I really believe that cre com creeping commercialism in, is, is behind this and that the Klan is just an excuse. In June of 1988, the council did repeal the access requirement of the cable television franchise. The channel went dark for a few days, and then our company reinstituted a similar channel, but it was called Community Programming Channel, which we continue to run under our editorial guidance. The American Civil Liberties Union has gone into federal court to sue Kansas City, claiming the city council took away the Klan's First Amendment right to a TV show on public access. Our point is, let them make their speech, and if the speech that they deliver on public access in Kansas City is, is, is illegal, then prosecute them. But let's not make that decision prior to even allowing them to speak. I became involved with this program, with what went on, uh, by applying my name to the um, complaint against American Cable Vision because they had overthrown public access television, which was a contractual right of the people in Kansas City. The first thing people will ask when they hear a controversial program is going to be shown on a public access channel is, why can't we censor this thing? Why can't we keep our airwaves clean from controversial speech? And really, there are two basic reasons why censorship is an unacceptable alternative. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibits government from acting to prevent speech with which it disagrees from being shown. And that's fundamental to our society, the promotion of diversity, allowing people to speak their mind. And of course, the basic character of access is such that uh, diverse programming and even controversial programming is essential to its vitality. Access channels were set up to be sort of an electronic park, a place where people could come and speak their mind. The original intention of Access was simply to uh, uh, make it possible for all Americans, uh, not just the wealthy and the media barons, uh, to be able to get a message out uh, via electronic media, this most powerful uh, medium we've ever developed uh, called television. Uh, from which a uh, rather wide range of people tend to be pretty systematically excluded. And uh, this was going to be an alternative to that. Now, there are a few limited categories of uh, uh, speech which are considered unprotected by the Constitution. Uh, fighting words is an example, words that are meant to provoke an attack uh, by another person, uh, words that present a clear and present danger. The example of it would be a person shouting fire in a crowded theater. Uh, obscene speech, uh, speech that appeals solely to prurient interest and is uh, when viewed in light of community standards. That's unprotected by the Constitution. But those are very limited categories, and what they all have in common is that uh, the courts view this type of speech as presenting a real danger to the public and having no element of ideas, one way or the other, reprehensible or not. This was uh, inherent in the idea of access, that uh, uh, it was there for people to say what it was they wanted to say. and. Uh, Obviously, you don't need a lot of protection for the ideas that everyone applauds. Uh, what you need the protection for are the ideas that people don't like. The fact is that most offensive speech contains ideas which may be stupid, ideas, they may be reprehensible, they may be stupid, but they're still ideas. And the First Amendment says those ideas can be heard. And those speakers who want to put forth those ideas can't be stopped. The intention wasn't really to, to get on the air. I mean, it takes too much intellectual uh, involvement in training for them to really want to come on the air. Uh, they basically wanted an issue that would allow someone to oppose them to get on the air so that in the end they could go on Oprah's show and Donahue's show and everybody else and, and, and get people in a more respectable forum to be able to be forced to represent their uh, concerned. They didn't care about getting on, on the, uh, the show itself, then they, they didn't even apply once they got on there just now going into training to, to get some of their people training, but 
we don't anticipate that they're going to really put on a show for any dura duration because they don't have no intellectual strength to sustain a show. Had it not been for the intense media coverage all the way up to the national level, Tom Brokaw sitting here talking about it, um, uh, it probably would have just been one of those out of sight, out of mind type of deals. Emmanuel Cleaver went on national television and stated that it was not a matter of freedom of speech, that it was uh, a racist thing that he was doing. You know, he was preventing racists from being on television. Well, this, you know, this was on uh, Donahue or Geraldo or one of these shows. The public access community was not offered that same voice. The media, particularly television, is the most powerful instrument that we have in the world, period. It, it, it ultimately is more powerful than money, than guns and weapons and everything because it creates images. I've been very disappointed over the years in terms of the type of characters that have been portrayed uh, on TV because it gives impression of the people that uh, we could uh, deal with being pimps and, and that type of thing. They don't see black people as people. We're still seen very much as savage beasts the same way we were during the slave trade. It tends to create this sort of revolving door complex. Black people look on television, they see themselves as negative, so they assume, well, I ain't nothing anyway, so why I have any hope? Why I try for anything? And the media is, plus you see, the thing about television is so powerful is that it's, it's involuntary. I mean, you just sit down, turn the thing on, and let it program you. I mean, it's just such a natural part of our daily functions, and yet we don't have any control over it all, at all. It's predominantly controlled by big business on the networks, and then, you know, by the cable operators. I feel that this is something that is needed because television is such an important part of everyone's home, and that people need the access to it. People need to be able to get on there and say things that aren't heard in mainstream television. And the other thing about this is that the Klan's ideas are not so interesting that they need to be hidden from the American public. I really believe that if you make something secretive, it makes it more attractive to people who might be attracted towards that. They're not trying to reach the vast majority of people in Kansas City. They got some sense to know that most people, good, decent people, are not going to be swayed by any of that, what they're putting on there. But there are, there is a segment of people out here that they will use this network to, to recruit and to organize. See, basically, they're not going to get on the air and talk about a whole lot of negative stuff. But they're going to talk about, call this number and get more information or come to this meeting. The Klan is a terrorist organization. It is a hate group. It is not some unpopular social group with an unpopular cause or some unpopular philosophy. We're talking about murderers. Well, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. I prefer to look at myself as a freedom fighter, especially now we're fighting for the, the freedom of speech. The elimination effort of the Public Access Channel was the greatest recruitment tool that the Klan could get uh, out of this whole deal. I mean, I mean, imagine if you're in an organization that only has six or seven members and you can say, I want to go on this channel and all of a sudden all media in town trips over themselves to get in. The city council even tramples over the Constitution to try and keep you off. That's the strongest power that a uh, recruitment power that you have. Uh, what doesn't give them the recruitment power is when their ideas have to stand on their own and if they're not given no more or no less consideration than anyone else, then there's no mystique power around them and they can't attract people uh, that would be in support of them. One time um, it was suggested that there might be as uh, few as four in this area, but four has caused a lot of havoc on a community. Um, I was, you know, the other night with the Cablevision, there were 11, you know, at the, uh, at the uh, Cablevision office. So I don't know. A lot of times the recruitment takes place very spontaneously. 
instantaneously. You know, you know, we pick up the phone, hey, you know, you don't have anything to do, would you join us? In July of 1989, because of a suit by the ACLU and some Supreme Court rulings that seemed to give a slightly different uh, scope to the First Amendment cases, okay. Kansas City decided to settle with the ACLU out of court and not go to trial on this issue. And as a settlement, uh, Kansas City agreed to require our company to reinstate an access channel. The district court, which uh, heard the Kansas City case, reached three very important conclusions about the First Amendment and public access. First, it concluded that access channels are a public forum, which in legal talk means they are devoted to speech and that government has very limited authority to regulate or restrict the type of activity that, or the type of speech that goes on the channel. The second thing the court decided was that access users have a right to sue to enforce their right to speak on the access channels. And the third thing the court decided, which was really the crux of the case, was that government can't close down an access channel merely because it disagrees with the content of the speech that's being cable cast. They're going through the training process, which is a six weeks uh, process, uh, on it. We believe mainly just a stalling tactic, you know, to make up for why they didn't show up for the first show that they fought so hard for. But they're going through this six-week training process, and anybody can go through that uh, process, as well as individuals, I mean, a standard group of people, volunteers, that will tape anybody that comes on the air. We intend to keep the community programming channel and we're starting a new channel that will be public access. There's a community video advisory board establishing all the rules for operating that. And the training has begun for crew people to work on access, much the way a broadcast station works. The, they're not connected with the programming at all. They're people who want to learn to run camera, character generators, or graphics, or whatever, regardless of what the content of the program is. So the idea, at least for uh, the startup phase of the new access channel, is that John Q. Public signs up to come and speak his mind and doesn't have the responsibility of getting his own crew. Their new guidelines, they came up with public access, but it's more of a soapbox kind of uh, format. So the Klan or any other group, no matter how uh, obscene or no matter how unacceptable, can be on the air for 15 minutes once a month, uh, and they have to be a Kansas City resident and they'll be allowed more than 15 minutes to get their taping done, but it's not going to be uh, complicated edited pieces with Rolands and so on. They're going to be straightforward. Uh, as one of the advisory board members said, you can have a podium and the flag of your choice. We ask that they return access in its full capacity, and they have not done that. In setting up this second new studio, we went back to the original franchise and the proposal and said, here's what's really needed to run an access studio and to keep it simple and uh, not to intimidate people uh, because some of our equipment was more complex than the uh, users wanted to learn. So we're going to have the access studio on a much more simple format. There will be uh, everything that's needed to produce informational type programming but not the bells and whistles that was at the other studio. Public access means that people should be comfortable with what they're making. They should be allowed to make a half hour, an hour, an hour and a half, a two hour documentary if that's what they want. I think there's uh, other communities, especially in the Midwest, can learn from Kansas City's, you know, uh, way of handling it. Uh, I'm not going to say Kansas City's mistake, but I'm going to say that they can learn through what Kansas City has been through. Well, first, do not try and keep them from getting on the air. That's what they want. Rally around and support the First Amendment. That's very important. Too many people have died for the First Amendment to allow it to be trampled over and people not to have faith that it will work in the end. But more importantly is to unite your community, unite and develop alternative program that highlights the positive aspect of, uh, of your community. That's really what the Klan can't stand. Uh, you know, th th they will move on uh, and you will be able to defeat them if they stay in the ring if you just have that type of faith. And uh, uh, most importantly, since it's kind of unique with the public access channel and we do plan to be involved in other issues with them around the country, is to 
make a strong, viable public access channel. Because just like uh, Bob Purvis's report showed, in communities where the public access channel was strong before the Klan issue came up, there was less of an effort to try and eliminate the public access channel. So create a viable, strong public access channel in your community, and you won't have to go through what we went through here in Kansas City. Authorities charged three Ku Klux Klan members with weapons violations Friday, a day after Kansas City police took them and 16 other men into custody outside American Cablevision's downtown studio. Police took the 19 persons into custody after searching several vehicles and confiscating an assortment of shotguns, rifles, handguns, ammunition, knives, stun guns, and clubs, police said. Members of the Mayor's Commission on Hate Group Activities met Friday and voted unanimously to ask American Cablevision to check its policies on weapons and to add a section stating that people will not be allowed to carry arms into the studios. The commission also voted to produce its own shows to counter the racist messages of the Klan. Shows might discuss race relations in Kansas City and ways people can improve them, commission members said. part Jewish, part Catholic, part Buddhist. I am Swedish. This is America if you're full of brotherly love. If you're full of brotherly hate, this is what America will become. Prejudice is something America can live without. Here's the unabridged explanation of how Deep Dish TV gets to you. It starts with thousands of producers making programs within their communities nationwide. They send their shows to coordinating producers, each in a different region working on a different show. All the edited shows are sent to Deep Dish Central in New York, where we coordinate the network. We take it to an uplink, which sends it to a satellite, which sends its beam back down to this hemisphere in a pattern called a footprint. Cable systems receive the signal in a dish and send it out to their subscribers on a public access channel, through the cable system to your house, to your TV, to your eyes. Deep Dish is a unique network because it isn't driven by profit or religion. We won't try to sell you anything. Public access is a vital component of our First Amendment rights. Stay tuned to Deep Dish and see Fearless TV. Hi, I'm Terry Doran, Director of Cable Access Incorporated, the support group for our public access channel, Channel 10, right here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You know, I'm standing here in front of the old fort, and Fort Wayne was named after General Mad Anthony Wayne, whose main claim to fame was doing away with the Indians. He did this in the name of progress and civilization. This is civilization. That's why I believe in Deep Dish. On Deep Dish, you can tell the Indian side of the story.
close for race and reason, the longest running show of its type on cable access TV, seen in approximately 50 cities across the United States, blazing the trail of real free speech, free speech for white working people for a change. You have seen a show called Race that's kind of deceptive. They don't say they're the Ku Klux Klan, but it is the same. It is trying to organize here in Austin and in Texas white people to support white supremacy and terror and to organize white people to be in the closet Klan or come out of the closet and join the Klan. This controversy started a long time ago over a hundred years ago, when the Ku Klux Klan was organized in the South to drive black people back from the progress that was made through the struggle to liberate themselves from slavery. This sordid history of over a hundred years has involved murder, genocide, rape, lynchings, threats, burning people's houses, and generally terror against black people, Mexican people, progressive people, Jewish people, gay people, anyone who opposes white supremacy. We on this show tonight denounce the Ku Klux Klan. We're going to take a stand against the Klan and start a discussion in the community as to why we think the Klan should not be on Channel 10. No freedom of speech for racist murderers. We invite your discussion. We invite your participation. Call the Cable Commission office. Get the Klan off the air. You don't think they should be on TV? No, they don't need to be on there. They don't even need to be in Austin. It's about killing people and so on, well, that's, that's not freedom of speech. That's uh, freedom of killing. Yeah. I feel that anybody that legitimizes the use of violence against a group, especially in a racist context, should not be allowed to speak. There is such a thing as free speech, but not if you go around saying that you want to kill the black people and send them to a different country. I think those people shouldn't be allowed to speak. Nobody in this country, if you don't espouse, you know, I want to be white and climb the corporate ladder, then your speech is going to be a bridge that's in right. this country. The, the stuff that's free, like ABC and, you know, <laughs> That's pretty much, that's their freedom of speech. That's white people's freedom of speech. That's not, blacks still aren't able to be free, you know, to express themselves on that kind of television. And we thought that this station was supposed to be the station to provide us a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, we have ABC, CBS, NBC running down their racist lines daily, right. hourly, minutely. And now we finally get a chance to, in some ways, begin to equalize that in the Klan and its power structure infiltrates that. I mean, to me, I just begin. <laughs> Like in, you know, in my house, I, I can see, I mean, we never use the expression, it's mighty white of you or anything like that, but we use expressions like going to garage sales, you know, you Jew the person down, it, it brings out the Jew in you, you know, you know that type of stuff. But um, it's not necessarily a cut down. It, it, it isn't? No, because Jews are known for their ability to save money, you know, their ability to... <laughs> I mean, you know, this, the whole with the drama organization, they own half the drama industry. You know, it's, during World War II, they were known for their ability, for their money, and, and saving it and all that kind of stuff. So that's where that expression comes from, but I wouldn't say that's cutting them down. How does your foot taste? <laughs> uh, I can't get it in that far. But you did. You managed somehow. That's prejudice, and, and I hear you... I'm not afraid of you. You're not someone who would want to attack me. But by the same token, you have a prejudged view of what I am, what I think, and what I do. And I'm about the world's worst businessman. It's easy to pick out a scapegoat, and without an adequate defense against that, it, it can actually become uh, 
the majority view in a society like Hitler's Germany. It was quite easy to persecute the Jews because they were there, they were convenient, and no one took a stand against it. Everyone uh, was closed mouth about it until they came for them. Early in 1989, one episode of Race and Reason was submitted to play on the public access channel. Luckily, we were prepared. Two years earlier, Cincinnati had an incident with electronic hate programming, which prompted us to initiate a specific outreach effort. We met with community leaders and religious leaders and elected officials about electronic hate programming, the principles of public access television, and what ACTV would do to handle the situation. We initiated our communications network early. When the episode was submitted, I informed the Board of Trustees. We had developed policies in advance to handle the situation. The Board then began to implement those policies. The first reaction I had when I heard that Race and Reason was uh, going to be shown on Columbus's access channel was that this is really going to test our community and find out what we're made out of. I, uh, I knew we'd done some work already on how we would handle such a show. But what we didn't know was what would the press do and what would the community do and would community organizations support us as much as we hoped they would. Uh, we had um, a procedure in place where the person who submitted the tape had to fill out the proper forms, where the person had to submit the tape and then give us time to schedule it. Uh, so it gave us time to meet with community groups, to inform city council of what was happening, and to get to the newspapers and the TV stations and to the radio stations and tell them, hey, this is what's going on. Uh, we would like your support. And they were most supportive. The race and reason situation was a golden opportunity for us to write about ACTV and to help the public understand the process by which ACTV uh, operates and how it obtains its programming and what sort of charter under which it operates. Essential to effective policies in dealing with electronic hate programming is the support of community organizations. When we met with community groups in 1989, they suggested the solution to the problem, counter-programming. I think it has been proven clearly uh, counter-programming is the best way to respond to um, the um, racist, uh, uh, anti-Semitic, and uh, oppressive uh, type of programming that has appeared lately in, in contemporary America. I think uh, showing clearly that their theses, their philosophies, their positions, and their data is inaccurate and that it does not reflect uh, the desire uh, of America in general, nor does it reflect the reality of America in general. I think you constantly have to work at establishing uh, the righteousness of your cause, the reality of your cause, and the best interests of America in your cause. And I think uh, those groups, as long as you continue to, to confront them in that manner, uh, you will be able to defuse and to defeat their initial uh, positions. Can you imagine what the American flag would look like if it had no red in it and no blue in it? and no white in it? It wouldn't look like an American flag at all, would it? Well, the American people are a lot of different colors, just like the American flag. So if you took away the red ones, and the black ones, and the yellow ones, and the white ones, and the brown ones, there wouldn't be any America left. And then where would you be? Prejudice is something America can do without. I think uh, race and reason resulted uh, in uh, the community becoming aware of the kind of support that, that is possible, that um, other voices will be there to speak about um, their interests. Uh, they're not going to um, crawl under a rock and they are not going to uh, be um, uh, wallflowers. They're going to speak up. And in fact, we did get, get a good turnout in, in our program that we used as a counter program. Uh, we got a good turnout from various groups to participate as guests in the interview we had. We have been reading in the newspapers and seeing on the news what seems to be a resurgence in violent crimes that have a racial or anti-Semitic bias. And many thoughtful people are becoming very concerned about this. Is what we see uh, really reflective of the real world out there, or is the media giving more play to these kinds of incidents, or is it a little of both? 
Dr. Smith? Well, I think it's a little of both. I think it's a catch-22, as we call it. It is important that the media expose these type of things. I think we never would have made the gains we made in the 60s if the media had not been there. Dr. King would never have been as successful as he was if the media was not there to, 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 to give the world a view of what prejudice really resulted in. Uh, but at the same time, it does uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, ex excite those who have authoritarian personality and need to lord themselves over others. So uh, the hope is that uh, uh, in the long run, the media does uh, a greater service than it does a disservice by bringing these things to the attention of the public. Mm -hmm. and suffered a concussion, a collapsed lung, broken fingers, and a fractured skull, ribs, and shoulder in the attack. Johnson has filed a $20 million civil suit against eight members of the skinhead gang involved in a weekend of beatings and robberies of gay men in the area of Peace Street Beach. The lawsuit, filed by Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, and a DC law firm claims that the skinheads violated Johnson's civil and constitutional rights by conspiring to attack him because he is gay. The suit also cites parents of the skinheads on the grounds that they... Um, I know that our, our organization has gotten a lot of criticism from uh, a wide spectrum of groups over our program. Uh, we've been called pornographic when all we've done is talk about uh, our issues. Uh, we've been called a lot of things, quite frankly. Um, and yet, the community recognizes our right to, to be on this program. And I think, you know, even though people realize and mostly here will agree that, uh, that this is not an ideal kind of programming, it's rather loathsome actually, uh, the Constitution has to work. Uh, if cable access is going to be for anybody, it has to be for everybody. And I think a lot of people took it for granted and, until this happened. Is there a solution to the potential conflict between civil liberties and the constitutional rights of freedom of expression? The question of uh, a solution to that problem is a very tough one. It's as old, I guess, as modern democracy. It's an ongoing problem. Inevitably, I suppose, in the democratic society, there will be a tension between what we call the First Amendment right of free speech and the concern for civil rights and the protection of group rights. And I suppose in one sense, it has to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Where would you draw the line when it comes to the f exercise of free speech on a public access channel? I've gotten into a lot of arguments with people. I, I really tend to feel that anybody who has an opinion is, is free, to, free to express it. And yet, I get, I get so disgusted and, and so dismayed with, uh, with groups who, who use this as an opportunity to express their hate. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. I think that's a difficult question to answer. Where would I draw a line? Because radical thought sometimes precedes public consciousness. And what may be perceived as radical in 1990 will be considered commonplace in 1995. I think where I would attempt to draw the lines is in those areas that are harmful to the public good. And those things would cause, that would create dangerous situations or provide misinformation. I think Justice Brandeis said it best in dealing with civil liberties and freedom of speech when he said, the fitting remedy for evil counsels is good ones. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evils by the process of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Other towns which have been presented with racist programming have learned to use it as a tool for outreach into minority organizations. While I think that this approach is politically strategic, it really does bother me that it takes racist programming to motivate an access center to do outreach to minorities. I'm offended by the notion that access centers use minority producers to counter racist views. Minority producers do not necessarily produce minority shows. Do Anglo producers just produce Anglo shows? An access center should be constantly striving to include the entire community in access. Access only works when people know they're welcome to participate. 
Would you train a white supremacist group to produce a program? Of course, I would train them. We train all kinds of people. This is public access. Is Albuquerque prepared for this? I think that the basic problem that comes up in any controversial programming situation is that the Access Center has not fully educated the community about how programming gets on the channel. When a program appears on the channel which offends someone, the Access Center is blamed for the content of that program and is often called irresponsible for letting it run. To me, a responsible Access Center is one which effectively educates the community about access and continuously outreaches for greater community involvement. Being prepared for controversy would mean that the community understands how access works. So instead of picketing the channel over a controversial programming, community members would know that their views are welcome to be produced too, and they would know the process that that, that takes. Have we been successful in Albuquerque at doing this? Well, we can always do more, but I think that we have had a great diversity of people using the channel. We've always encouraged people to produce programs which give positive views of their community, not necessarily to counter racist notions, but to speak for themselves to the community. white supremacist group came in and asked you to air one of their programs. Robin! What would I do if a white supremacist group brought a program to the channel to air? Well, my job would be to ask the white supremacist group to follow the same procedures as any other group or organization that currently uses the channel. Public access means just that, and since the white supremacist group is a part of the public, uh, whether or not we want to admit it, I think we need to provide public access to all. Good morning, Albuquerque! Good morning, Good morning Albuquerque! This is Carol Mayberry. Good morning, Albuquerque. Welcome. <laughs> Smith, better known as Gossiping K. And this is Gladys Jones, better known as Uninformed. Girl, did you hear about them, them kids in California that was being killed? Child, no. Mm hmm. Girl, did you hear about the riot in Florida? Mm hmm. Girl, wait a minute. Did you hear about the man at the bagel shop? The one he was going, he was killing people and stuff? Killing people? Yeah. Mm hmm. Girl, what you, and, and wait a minute, and the teenagers. They run around killing their parents and stuff. Child hush. Mm -mm. Must be mm -hmm. rough, honey. And, must and be rough. Must be. Yeah, must be, honey. God bless you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, girl, Channel 27. Did you hear they want to take the funding away from Channel 27? The funding away? Yes, girl. See this woman put on a show and she had a nude man on there, and they want to put. A, they want to take the funding away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people make a good. You know, they make some good shows on there. Yeah, they do. I think producers would respond by continuing their regular programming. Um, I couldn't see them interrupting their regular schedules to heighten the uh, media attention that um, the white supremacists are needing at this point. I, I basically think they would continue with their regular programming. Hoy les presento una mujer muy especial. Su nombre es Aguida Castillo. 
Es una mujer que ha ayudado a mucha gente durante sus 84 años en este mundo. Es una mujer que asistió a más de 1,900 hijos y hijas a entrar a este mundo como partera. Es una mujer que asistió mucha gente con sus remedios como curandera. Es mamá de cinco hijos y una hija. Es abuelita de 21 nietos y tiene 31 bisnietos. Sí, Aida Castillo es una mujer muy especial. Señora Castillo vive en el barrio de San José. Ha trabajado después de elecciones en San José por más de 50 años. Mi nombre es Steve Gallegos. Señora Castillo era prima hermana de mi abuela, Anita Cedillo, y buena amiga y vecina de mi otra abuela, Rosalía Gallegos. También asistió a mi mamá como partera cuando yo nací. Les presento prima Aida Castillo. In my view, the racist hate programming is only one of the many controversial programming areas that Access has to deal with. Why are we so worried about the racists using Access to speak for themselves? Does pretending that they don't exist make any more sense? The real issue seems to be the tremendous potential for offending the powers that be and our sources of funding, and therefore losing access for everyone else. But this is a political reality for every program that we run. To me, the bottom line is that we are in the business of providing access to television for everyone, regardless of how abhorrent or politically unacceptable their views may be. Are we really going to provide access to television, or are we just going to pretend and try to save our jobs? that you want to allow non-whites into your society when these same non-whites have nothing but hate for you. If one can show the, the people of the country or the state or the world that there was no Holocaust, that there was no six million people gassed or executed, that's a tremendous piece of knowledge. If, if the Jews have lied about one thing and have gotten hundreds of billions of dollars from Israel, from the United States and West Germany, Why not, why not tell the truth? If it's truth, let it come out. If it's wrong, prove it's wrong. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Pornzy. <laughs> uh, he, when he came into the Access Center, I was approached uh, to where I was going to be as liaison in his quest to air race and reasons. I personally, because of my persuasion, as you can plainly see, I don't agree with what he stands for. But that's my right to disagree with what he stands for. And it's his right to be able to come on public access and say exactly what he wants to say. The worst thing that we could do is to react to this the way that other access centers and city government reacted in other areas that not per se Dr. Point said have ventured into, but other uh, organizations that stood and believed in the same things that he do. We could freak out. We could all of a sudden call Jones and the Cable, all the cable subscribers of Jones and the Cable, and threaten to discontinue uh, subscribing to Jones. We could have producers to all of a sudden threaten and say that they no longer want to produce at the Public Access Center, but then that's what those type programs are doing. We, as not only producers or people in the city of Tampa, what we need to do is to unite. Just as we did a few years ago, when blacks were trying to just get a chance to vote, when blacks were just trying to get a decent seat on the bus, ride a train, go to a movie, just sit in a nice, decent restaurant and have a meal. For every race and reason program that airs on our channel, there is nothing keeping any other organization here within the city of Tampa and coming down and producing two other programs to counteract his. So, hey, let's show... Dr. Poinsett and his organization the same thing that we've shown them since they've been here. We're going to give you the same opportunity to voice your opinion. We, not, we, uh, we don't exactly have to agree with it. But this, this organization, any other organization, any type of programming, will never come and unroot our public access center because it's too strong. And I feel that the mentality of Tampa, the mentality for us, the people in Tampa, are too strong to, for us to be beaten down by programming brought in here by Dr. Poinsett.